people uh, thought that if we get bad GDP numbers, it would mean that power could s soon uh, start reducing interest rates. We got that, and the market's starting to factor less interest rate. Uh, well, well, now there's not even a now they're forecasting one, not even one rate cut this year. So I mean, I don't know if, if any of the economists on the space or people that are economically smarter than I am may have a, 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 any views around that. I've been wrong about most things, but I've been saying there'll be no cuts for over a year while everybody was smoking. That's the energy. only reason. That's the only reason why I thought there may be a cut because you've been wrong about so many things and you said there was going to be no cuts. That's why I said, okay, look, mm -hmm. they made the cut. Yeah, I'm like the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, they just, I mean, if you believe the numbers, there's no reason for them to cut. Generally, there has been no reason. Right? If you believe the jobs are strong and you believe that inflation is coming down, uh, then, like I said, that requires you believing the numbers, but those are the numbers that the government is giving. It would literally, uh, maybe now the GDP numbers are different, but as of yesterday, rationally, if we were in an election year, it would make more sense looking at the data presented for the Fed to hike the to cut. If things are yeah. strong, uh, if everything's strong, they, they, they should theoretically be able to hike. But, so the GDP numbers, a, but the GDP numbers came in much weaker than expected, which means the economy is actually slowing down. That right, that, that's what I'm saying. So yesterday, now you could say, as you said, you can make an argument now for, you know, cuts. But I, I just want to remind people that if you looked in December, we were supposed to get four to six cuts this year. And if you went to a year ago this time, we were supposed to have had three to four cuts in 2023. Still no cuts. And by the way, if you look at history, anytime you do see a yield curve uh, normalizing, which we haven't seen yet, but usually get a yield curve uh, uninverting or normalizing, then you get a Fed pivot, and then the stock market crashes. So, like, everybody cheering for the rate cuts clearly hasn't looked back to know that when they cut, it means something's broken, and that precedes the drop in markets. So, I, I, I just, it, it, it makes my brain hurt sometimes when people get so excited at the idea of cuts because they're only getting cut if something's wrong. They'll cut if the stock market. Oh, let me, I mean, so, I mean, Scott, is there any chance that the bull market's over, bro? I don't think so. I, uh, for for Bitcoin, I, I seriously doubt it. Um, Peter Brandt came on and actually laid out a really nice statistical case based on historical evidence for what that would look like, and he put it at twenty five percent. He's smarter and a better analyst than me, so. I will uh, lean in his direction and say 25% chance at the top is in and that we don't see like a repeat of the cycle. But like you said, that means there's a 75% chance we have a repeated parabolic cycle and he's long and that's where his bet's at. So I would rather just reiterate uh, an expert's position on that. Uh, my case, the, the thing I've been saying the whole time, and once again, I have no better information or predictions than anyone else, is that it would make a hell of a lot of sense if you do believe in Bitcoin cycles that we get really boring and time-based capitulation for the next four to six months. We sweep the lows, maybe make another new low, go back up to the highs, we're all going to make it, hits the lows, it's all over. I literally just posted a chart showing all the times that everyone was euphoric and panicked in this bull run that started at 25,000, some would argue 17,000, it's just the way humans are. When you go sideways, they lose their damn minds. And when you get to the top of the range, we're going to new highs. And when you get to the bottom, it's over and we're going to 5,000. That's just how human minds work. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you should expect four to six months after the halving, if you believe in the cycle, where it's really boring, low volume, crappy summer. Uh, all coins kind of slowly bleed out, except for like certain sectors, like a DeFi summer type thing. And then you ramp up in the fall. And in an election cycle, which, by the way, has is the same four-year cycle as crypto, would you be surprised to see them let the stock market fall, you know, into the summer? And I say let because we know that a lot of it is based on, uh, you know, how the government uh, reacts. Let it fall and then ramp it back up go, uh, going into the fall before the election so that uh, markets look good and they can win. It's not even conspiracy theory. I mean, this happens over and over again. 
Yeah, bear so markets it. don't happen during election years. Um, the incumbent president will get totally smoked. It's it's in the best interest of the Treasury and the Fed to make sure that um, uh, stock prices Correct. go up, which makes today's data all the more worrisome because now you have stagflation. And so it throws another another hat into the ring. And so now the Fed has to keep rates high, but the president is tapping Powell's shoulder. So, I mean, I think stagflation for the remainder of the year is uh, is a pretty safe bet. And, you know, probably into, into next year could be a stagflationary decade, frankly. But... Totally agree yeah. on the on the asset prices front. They're not going to fall this year. Yeah, I mean, Joe, but would you be surprised, you know, uh, to see them fall now far enough before the election? You know, a correction. I'm talking about a normal correction, not, uh, you know, necessarily a bear market. And then ramp up when it actually matters and people are paying attention and the elections come. That's a pretty safe bet, for sure, for sure. Because right now, the S&P 500 is down, what, 5.5%? And that's totally par for the course with other historical corrections during bull markets. It's just because we've been up and to the right so often, like this this feels very strange, but it's really not. I mean, Bitcoin's been consolidating for, what, eight weeks now, around uh, 60 to 70K. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, asset prices cooled off, had a bit of a correction before we had more clear guidance on what the Fed and Treasury were going to do. Um, and then, you know, July, August, September, you see asset prices begin to rise again, probably even sooner, frankly. But I think like a, a reprieve right now, um, definitely nothing indicating to me that this is a you know a trend reversal and we're going way further down yeah and, and people who are panicking when we're going from seventy four thousand to the low sixty three thousands either won't weren't here or don't remember the 30 to 40 percent corrections that used to be normal in every single bull cycle this has been a dream we're getting 20 percent or sub 20 percent corrections on the way up which should be way less panic than the 30 and 40 corrections of the past i mean anyone who was here uh, you might recall, like, if you were here in 2018, for example, when Bitcoin was at 6,000, I mean, it, it, after the uh, rate, the move to 20, it came down to six, then bounced back up to around 11. But then we sat basically with 6,000 as a floor from effectively June until I believe it was November, if I remember correctly. And then that 6,000 floor that nobody think, thought could ever break broke, and we were at 3,000 in a matter of a couple of weeks, right? 50% drop, doom, death, despair. I'm seeing that kind of sentiment in my comments. I literally just tweeted about it. I mean, Mike Alford and I just did a show where he, based on a tweet, an article that he said he thinks 90,000 is possible in the next couple of months. In the next couple of months. I don't think I've seen angrier comments about how dare you bull post, like we're bleeding, everything's down, and they're still bull posting. I'm like, dude, I've been bull posting since the bull market started at the bottom. So I'm not going to stop now. I still think we're going up. And so sentiment I is just, just in I the want to read. I want to read two things to you. The first thing I'm reading is, for those who don't understand what happened, first quarter GDP slowed to 1.6, which is less than half of the 3.4 of last quarter. Reading, this reading is 50% below Goldman Sachs' expectations, but it gets worse. At the same time, U.S. core PC index soared from 2% to 3.7%. The cr this crushed the estimates of 3.4%, which means inflation is on the rise while the economy is actually getting smashed. We have a weakening economy with rising inflation. This is the worst possible outcome for the Fed. What do you think? Yeah, it's true. That's stagflation right there. And it's the first period of, I think, what could be prolonged stagflation since the 70s. And in the 70s, um, you look at home prices, they they uh, 4 or 5x. But you're right. So GDP, the estimate was for 2.5%. Goldman Sachs estimated 3.4%. It came in half of that. So it came in at 1.6%. Very bad. And this is just the advanced print, by the way. So there are three prints. There's the advanced prints, and then the print, and then the uh, revision. So this is just number one. This could change, but usually it's pretty accurate. And reminder, the Fed's GDP target that it sets for the U.S. economy when it's setting monetary policy is 2%. So this is the this is the first decline in two years. Um, this is the lowest level in two years. The first uh, major major decline below the two percent target in two years as well. Uh, and so this is not a good look. And so you'd think, okay, great, rate cuts are coming to be supportive. But then at the same time, uh, core consumer prices. Okay, so we're talking the the necessities of the necessities, the stuff that people need to buy. Uh, the estimate was for that to accelerate at a two percent clip this quarter, and it accelerated at a three point seven percent clip and so in the same breath that gdp is uh you know it's low it's 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 faltering it could go negative uh it would make sense to cut rates now to support uh economic and financial stability um 
price inflation is still uh, more than uh, two times, almost four times uh, the pace that it should be. And so this is thankfully, and it's a terrible situation for the Fed to be in. And the Fed's going to have to stay right where it is. It's going to have to stay right where it is. And that's going to upset the U.S. Treasury. It's going to upset um, uh, Joe Biden. Um, but at the end of the day, you'd rather have You'd rather have prices come back down to target. Voters care a great deal more about that. Um, but of course, the the balancing act here is making sure that you don't throw GDP into negative territory while you do that. You don't throw people out of work. And so it's going to be a very testy couple of months to make sure that the unemployment rate stays right where it is and GDP doesn't actually uh, dip negative. Yeah, Joe, how, many, how often do we see those revisions uh be positive, <laughs> right? I mean, we always see the, the job numbers print and then quietly three or four weeks later, you see uh, a revision. Yeah, 12 it's always to the downside. So, so yeah. Scott, that's actually, that down, yeah. Scott, that's actually totally not accurate. It's confirmation bias. You, you notice when they revise in the negative direction. You don't notice when they revise. It's been very bias. consistent in the last year. I can't say. Uh, yeah, no, I have a, you can go maybe, back in my right, timeline. I have a chart on the yeah, you can go back in my timeline. I don't. I, I won't pull it up now. But yeah, I have a chart of uh, non-farm payrolls prints. Like eleven of the last thirteen have been revised downward after the fact, and that that hap that is so systemic it can't be an accident. Um, just looking at the data, and also um, there was a I think like a, a five sigma beat, um, w meaning that like it, uh, 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 there was a, there were uh, two two sigma beats and then a five sigma beat on non-farm payrolls, um, and the the two of which obviously January and February were revised down after the fact we haven't received the revision for March but it's so systemic that it um it, it has to be uh, data manipulation like just looking at the data and being totally objective you can't have that many beats to the very right of the bell curve extreme and have it be a total accident mm. I, I tend to agree Mar Mario ran I think we're having trouble getting any co-host invites up. So it seems like I'm going to have to sit here by myself, but that doesn't mean you guys, I can't co-host, but uh, I think, uh, Rayan, as you, I mean, as you look at this, are you starting, you, you asked me the question, do you think there's a chance the bull market's over? Do you think there's a chance the bull market's over now looking at this? Because we've all kind of remained, you know, uh, bullish throughout the entire cycle. I mean, I said, you know, to Peter Brandt, put it at 25%. I put this to the whole panel, but I mean, does anybody believe that uh, this, even in this election year, that things are so bad that uh, the top could be it? Uh, I'll, I'll speak. Uh, I'd, I'd say a thousand percent no. I'd say uh, we've been crying for this cooling off period and uh, it's never easy. I always look at my family and friends and sense the anxiety with these market moves and realize it's actually a good indication that uh, when people start to get uncomfortable, uh, it's been up only far too long. Um, no way, Jose. I, I do maintain, though, you know, some of these uh, past predictions on Bitcoin are getting a bit out of hand. Um, you know, and I'll think of, uh, you know, chatting with a guy like Vinny, you know, putting 120 uh, as, as a max. You know, I think personally he had a max of, of, of 150 uh, with a conservative 120 target on Bitcoin. Um, I think we, this is healthy. I think uh, we're getting what we asked for. We're getting a, a slight cool off period. And, you know, as they say, sell in May and go away. Let's hope that that continues. Juan, what do you think? Uh, I am very much in, in that uh, kind of a camp as well. Uh, I think, you know, right now, part of the concern is is the macro picture, as, as you guys were discussing, is dimming a bit. Uh, the flows into the ETFs, which were all the rage over the past couple months, uh, have started slowing. Uh, you know, we had 1.5 billion in inflows in January, 6 billion in February, March was 4.6, and now in April, cumulatively, we're at 170 million. So they're definitely uh, slowing, but that's the first wave of, of inflows, uh, which were the early adopters. Uh, and as, as we've pointed out, uh, me and, and Matt and other people at Bitwise, there's a second wave coming that we think is going to start in the in the back half of the year, uh, which is the wirehouses. You know, uh, Satera, which is a big independent, the wirehouses and broker dealers, Satera is a big one, and they were the first ones to approve the Bitcoin ETFs last month. Uh, but uh, just today, I think there was an article out talking about Morgan Stanley. They've been in the, in the news in the last couple of weeks about exploring them. Um, and they're saying that 
they're 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 being careful about it, but that but they're going to make it available to to everyone, uh, and they want to do it in a controlled way. So they're you know they're they're doing their process, they're taking their time. Um, LPL uh, said uh, last month that they were they were uh, they were planning to take three months to determine which Bitcoin funds to add. So again, all of these all of these uh, big wirehouses and broker dealers are are undergoing their due diligence process, and so I think we'll start seeing approvals. Uh, after after the summer and in the fall, uh, and that'll in, in, and that'll bring a new wave of capital uh, into the system, which I think will be positive. Uh, and then outside of the the those kinds of flows, uh, we have the approvals from Hong Kong. Uh, they're launching at the end of this month three three Bitcoin ETFs and three Ethereum ETFs. I think that will be additive as well. And then outside of that, I'm focused on the innovation that's happening in the space. Um, Tether just announced they're they're expanding the scope of their of, of the initiatives that they're pursuing. They're now establishing four different divisions, data, finance, power, and education, uh, pursuing things in AI and, and uh, P2P platforms in, in the data division, uh, expanding uh, Tether, uh, expanding USDT in the finance division, along with other blockchain-based solutions, uh, financial blockchain-based solutions, including a tokenization platform. Uh, they're expanding mining, uh, sustainable mining uh, in the power division, and then launching a whole host of blockchain-based educational uh, services. Mind you, this is Tether is a is a company that in Q in January announced Q4 profits of 2.85 billion dollars. So they're extremely well capitalized, and they're going to put a lot of money into this space. So I think uh, innovation there. Uh, Block just announced a three nanometer Bitcoin mining chip. Uh, that's top of the line. I think the the most efficient ones right now are four nanometers. So they're they're going even even uh, even better, uh, even more efficient, which will help the miners uh, and as a whole. We're seeing the activity on runes explode uh, since since the halving, uh, and then on on tokenization. Uh, you know, Tether announced an initiative, but we saw. Uh, BlackRock put out their first tokenized fund, and they've been vocal about a tokenization roadmap. So I'm, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see more funds from them and then other big Wall Street players. So I think tokenization is also going to invigorate the system. And then the VC ecosystem, VC capital is ramping up quarter over quarter. We're seeing increased uh, VC uh, allocations, and I think that will drive innovation further. So I think if you put more innovation uh, and more capital coming into the system uh, through the flows of the ETFs in the back half of the year, I think that's all very constructive uh, for, for the price of Bitcoin ultimately o over the next, you know, six to 12 months. Do we have any bears? Can it, is there a bear? Uh, 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 so you, Elizabeth, you raised your hands. Maybe you're just commenting. Oh, no. you're, not the, you're not the bear I'm looking <laughs> no, for. I know. I know. I that's super bullish. And I, I would love to just jump in and say I totally second everything. Like this is absolutely what we're seeing through Xverse. So I'm I'm at Xverse, which is the leading Bitcoin wallet for the Web3 Bitcoin space. So all the fun stuff that's happening for runes, ordinals, BRC20, that's stuff that we're leading support on. And I have to say, just seeing all the innovation in the space, you know, at a, as a wallet, um, you really get a seat at the center of all the action and get to see everything that's happening with DeFi and ordinals and um, and also the liquidity on all the investors coming into this space. And I have to say right now, it's really incredible to see all the L2s that are coming out and all the TVL is just incredible. Um, all the investment, I think many of them haven't even announced their rounds yet. And it's just going to take probably a month or two for this to settle in. And then we're going to see this demands, these demands being met and all the more value being driven into the ecosystem. And once the demands are um, met, we're, we're seeing these already demands surging for new protocols because of protocols like runes. Um, people are going to need to have uh, more programmable capabilities and the transactions are going to go up. So they're going to need these L2s. And then once that happens, we're going to see this kind of flywheel effect for more talent, more investors into this space and ultimately uh, I think that is going to have um, some some uh, price action consequences in, in a positive way so yeah super bullish Fred. yeah just uh, to put a little bear sentiment out there I'm not uh, you know I am not a bear but I do looking at it um, as unbiased as possible I think the biggest bear case which is you know certainly possible is just a terrible election result for the pro-crypto forces in the U.S. in November. Um, I think if 
uh, that if everybody that's pro crypto just gets rolled and we have some of the really malevolent forces stick in there, I think that'll be bearish for at least, you know, a couple of months at that time. And does it change the cycle? I don't think so, but it definitely could be a big driving factor, um, which is why everyone's got to be on guard if you're in the U.S. and really do everything you can to make sure those pro-crypto people get elected. And, and I keep repeating, if that means just donating five bucks, you get these candidates get credit when they get more people that are donating, even if it's a low value. And uh, we all know uh, on, on the stage up here who we're gunning for in Massachusetts, because if that uh, goes the right way, um, I think it'll open the floodgates for the bull market. But, but that's the biggest bear case I personally yeah. see. To that end, just a quick plug. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm very constantly in, in touch with John Deaton, who you're obviously alluding to there. We're doing a fundraiser for anyone going to consensus on the 30th. Uh, so get in touch with me if you're uh, interested in supporting that. That is, to me, if we're talking politics, Elizabeth Warren being unseated, to me, is almost as important as uh, a wholesale change at the SEC or, or elsewhere, because I think that uh, she's the linchpin in all of it. It's the most fundamental uh, fundamental fight that we can, we can pick. So, you know, he out, he out fundraised uh, Elizabeth Warren, I think, in, in the last report. Um, and I intend to do everything I can to help him double and triple her fundraising in, in the coming months. So if you guys are interested in helping John, uh, please, please get with me. We're putting a very, very powerful, uh, machine behind him where we can. So, uh, go, go ahead, Alex. I, I would say all I heard right there, Scott, is that out of state dark money crypto billionaires from Florida are trying to undo democracy. Oh my God, that's, that's I was literally think. killed to be whatever you just described me as, but uh, unfortunately, wildly, wildly uh, inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm definitely obviously more on the bullish side of the market here. I think we're definitely going to see, I think, more correction and downside. I don't think we'll get anywhere near... And of course, now I'm going to friggin' jinx it, but like, I don't think we're going to get anywhere near the lows of like 17 or 25K. I, I think maybe 40 to 50 we see. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it, to, to the point you were kind of making earlier, it's going to feel awful for a lot of people because I have never seen an industry with hedonic adjustment like crypto. If you like hit a new high for a day and then drop 5% off of it, people act like it's the end of the freaking world, right? Um, it's just, it's ridiculous how quickly people assume that any new high is the new floor. So like, yes, it will go up, it will go down. Um, I think to the point Elizabeth was making, there's a whole bunch of stuff getting built right now. I spend a bunch of time in the Stacks ecosystem. We just launched the first step of a major network upgrade earlier this week. Um, and, you know, saw, saw a ton of traffic and response on it and a ton of new inbound builders. So like, it is Bitcoin is definitely like where things are happening, where I think this next cycle will be based around. But I think to that point, like when exactly, what exactly the pattern looks like, exactly how it goes, like nobody can really tell you. I think it's it's uh, strap in. Um, uh, Alex, I also uh, don't think the elections are going to matter that much. Alex, I want to before going back to the markets, I want to yeah. ask about uh, about runes. Uh, I did a panel with Coin Telegraph and a few others in the ecosystem, just about the the. the the, according to many disappointing performance of runes. I want to get your thoughts on the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. Uh, I know you're involved, so you've got some biases there, uh, but I'm not sure if you could give us your thoughts, but also play devil's advocate, because I'm as bullish as you, if not more bullish. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I think runes had... Runes was almost never going to live up to the hype, right, at the having because of how much excitement and intensity there was. But don't underestimate at the same time. Like if you go back and you look at like what Bitcoin transaction fees were uh, for the, you know, almost entire week after the halving, um, you know, we were seeing two, three, four, I mean, at the halving itself, we were at 2,500 sats a byte. I mean, normally Bitcoin has historically been at five to 10. So literally like 200 X increases uh, in demand for network and block space. So I think that's really one of the strongest arguments, and this is the reason we've been talking a lot about Bitcoin L2s and why they're necessary, is that if it costs you $100 to send a Bitcoin transaction, you're not exactly going to be using that to pay for coffee, 
or anything else, right? Um, and I think that's a big so part what of is, what maybe, is maybe, driven maybe, maybe the excitement. Alex, maybe you can give us like a, a just a TLDR on the latest developments to the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, everything from, from runes and ordinals to Merlin. You see a very yeah. basic high-level overview of what each of them is and how important it is to the ecosystem. Sure. So uh, ordinals, for folks who don't know, is basically storing data on the Bitcoin chain. Um, uh, roughly speaking, non-fungible tokens, except they're actually stored on the chain instead of off the chain, came out about a, a little over a year ago is when they started popping off and uh, has led is really the thing that drove the entire resurgence of building on Bitcoin. Um, Elizabeth has spent a lot of time on this and, and can talk about it really well as well, but just brought in a ton of new builders, a lot of excitement, because basically, if you go all the way back to 2017, and what's called the block size wars on Bitcoin, when basically people were fighting over, hey, should, should blocks be bigger than four megabytes on Bitcoin? It was decided they should not be. That drove a lot of builders out of the ecosystem. It's part of the reason that Ethereum took off the way it did and had uh, the cycles that it did in 2017, 19, 20, 21, um, is because people kind of gave up on building on Bitcoin. And what Ordinals showed is, hey, we can actually take the technical standards that exist on Bitcoin today uh, and build, uh, uh, you know, build an ecosystem based off of that. So that brought a bunch of builders in. A few months later, you saw BRC20s come out. Same thing, taking advantage of the technical standards that were already on Bitcoin, not having to change the L1, um, and introducing meme coins. So the largest of that is called Ordi. There's, a, again, hundreds of other ones. Um, I think the total market cap on BRC20s is like so essentially, in the mid So, Alex, right so Ordinals is NFTs. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. BRC20s are yeah. just fungible tokens. Yeah, Bingo. I can simplify it and real quick. Like Bitcoin oh, is yeah. become the top chain for NFTs. Like right now, Bitcoin is the number one chain for NFTs. You're saying and volume, now Runes volume, is basically... Elizabeth, volume is more than Solana and ETH? Then, yeah, more than ETH, more than Solana, at least yeah, from yesterday. <laughs> and uh, and now Runes are like, uh, excuse excuse my French, but shit coins on Bitcoin. This is This is, so we have NFTs and now we have... The meme coins and the so, so shit coins. So shit coins could be anything from meme coins to actually tokens with utility, and obviously how you define utility, everyone disagrees and, and debates that. But essentially, just allowing ERC twenty tokens onto on Bitcoin. You've got all these different ideal like launches now on the Bitcoin ecosystem, correct? Yep, that is that is correct, and we could go we could go really deep on technical standards and how it differs and, and where some of the limitations are, but fundamentally that's right. What's, uh, um, and, what's, and again, what's, just comes uh, to this idea that- uh, Sorry, uh, one, more, one more question there. What's Merlin chain? How would you define that? I would, all right, I'm just gonna be provocative. That one's very polarizing. Um, yeah, so, so here's the deal. What you have is earlier this year, starting at the beginning of the year, when it became very clear that the next cycle was going to be Bitcoin focused. Since January of this year, you have probably seen 50 Bitcoin L2s, and I'm going to use the word L2s in air quotes, launch. Um, that's not an exaggeration. There's literally been 50 of them. And a lot of them are just, uh, you know, basically fake. You know, they're, they're like, oh, come run Ethereum smart contracts on top of Bitcoin. And all they're trying to do is get, generate TVL to generate hype and the, the general way that this works is that they create their own token and then they say hey you can now stake on our token you know stake on our network and you'll win rewards and what that what that means is you send some bitcoin to yourself using a bitcoin op code for time lock right so basically mario if you have a bitcoin right you just send it to yourself with this time lock on it and then they consider that staking the Bitcoin on their network. Keep in mind, it never left your control, it never went onto the network. You're not doing it for anything on the network, but you are earning points for the airdrop farming. And then they go and they say, oh, say, see here, there's, there's TVL on our network, even though it's not actually going anywhere. Okay. And then they get investment from outside and they basically roll that same $100 million of investment through a smart contract over and over and over again. You'll remember a couple of years ago on Solana, there were a couple of brothers who basically got called out for doing this and generating like $8 billion in TVL off of the same like 
hundred million of original investment. And people are just taking that same playbook and running it over. So one of the things I've been telling people. So then they'll get that same hundred million dollars and they put it through a time lock to kind of multiply it to whatever billion. Yeah, basically they'll, they'll create just a series of smart contracts on this new network and they'll, uh, you know, it's almost like liquid staking works where they can take that same hundred million, put it into the smart contract, generate a liquid token, uh, and then reinvest that again. And it's just like one investor's money being rolled over and over again. Hold on. That... Okay. That sounds pretty fucked up unless there's like a, something I'm missing here. Uh, but then there's... Yeah, it's a, mar- it's a marketing scheme. But it's, it's a marketing so scheme. Back, That's all it is. So going back and, and before Scott kills me, just going back to that sound like Merlin chain. Um, so when you say it's an L2, but it's on Ethereum, how does that work? So... What, what they're doing, you know, one of the questions, so all smart contracts on Ethereum are based on solidity and run in, you know, what's called EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, other chains, for instance, Solana, you know, it's a Rust-based system. It does not use EVM. Stacks, where we're building, uses Clarity and Clarity VM. Um, a lot of the debate is, hey, what should this stuff get built in? The easiest thing to do is to just create a layer that is basically its own chain, runs EVM contracts because there already are a lot of EVM contracts, right? If you make a quote unquote L Bitcoin L2 that runs on EVM, you don't have to convince developers to actually rewrite their code into something else. You can just get them to uh, come over and use their existing smart contracts. And again, for someone who's just trying to kind of attract a lot of momentum and attention up front to generate more investment, uh, that's the lowest barrier to entry, and but it's also the least sticky. The least steady, why? Oh, sorry, least sticky, because like people aren't actually really investing in the ecosystem. They're just like trying to generate airdrop points, so they hopefully get you know some coin given to them that becomes worth something, and they can dump on retail. Huh, right, Scott? Sorry, man. I just wanted to kind of geek out on the Bitcoin ecosystem. Go ahead, John. Go back to the markets. It's cool. You sound like you're. In, you sound like you're in the middle of a car engine which is cool oh, the, i know that you're biohacking your yeah, brain just, or something i just started the pimp machine which is like zapping my body um but yeah i, I just i think we should do a whole zapping thing. your body okay bro. Wait, wait, wait let's do a space on zapping your body oh, what the fuck oh, yeah. are you doing Dude, my wife my wife does the pemf she swears by it it's yeah, yeah like, it's, it's amazing it's, it's, it's yeah it's 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 uh, pretty damn good I, I was just in the red light earlier when if, you, if you hear a thumping that's me punching myself in my <laughs> face repeatedly to get the blood flow going uh db you've been waiting for a while yeah wait real quick sorry scott let me just real quick i just want to jump in because i did just say you know there's like all this stuff you got to be suspicious of the one thing i want to call out is there is a lot of legitimate stuff getting built on bitcoin and the one thing i'd encourage people to do is like just look at the history of the team and how long ago they started working in the bitcoin space if someone started building on bitcoin in january 2024 or later certainly just be like really suspicious if it's someone who has been in it since at least mid 2023, let alone, you know, you can find people who've been building in Bitcoin for 10 years. Like those are the more reliable projects. Folks who came around in the first few months after ordinals, when it got back, like those are the people who, you know, you, you can be a little more trusting. If it's, if they've been around for two months, just like anything in crypto, be fucking suspicious of those. People. Yeah. So Alex, I've just sent you through, um, uh, my, my WhatsApp number, I'd love to talk to you off, offline just about this because I'm, and Elizabeth, the same thing, I've just sent it to you now on WhatsApp, um, just because I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the by, by the ecosystem and I'm still, uh, there's a lot for me to learn as well. Um, and I think for the audience as well, because obviously you guys care about what you learn, not what I learn. So we'll do a space on this, uh, kind of just go, go do a much bigger deep dive into the Bitcoin ecosystem because there's a lot happening um, that um, there's not being talked about. But yeah, Scott, I think you're going to DB. Um, Mario, I was just going to say to that end, also, as you know, since we are partners on my YouTube channel, Beyond, Yago is actually launching a show. Uh, it'll either be this Saturday or next Saturday that's going to be weekly exclusively about uh, covering everything that's happening on, on a Bitcoin in general. So that that's going to be awesome. Yeah, Yago. Yago's <laughs> one of More my- information for both you and I. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yago, is, I, I spoke privately to Yago even before my Cointelegraph panel as well. He's going to ask him a few questions. Uh, he's pretty easy. he's been in the bitcoin ecosystem well respected been in the ecosystem for a long time um so yeah he does a show on scott's channel the wolf of wall street uh, i think it's launching or launching he, he started a space as well I'm, I'm yeah we're gonna either launch we're editing the first one it's awesome so that'll be done hopefully for this saturday or if not it'll be next saturday but it'll be weekly on saturdays on my youtube yeah it's gonna be awesome. 
Yeah, yeah. So check out Scott's YouTube channel. I think he does spaces at a weekly Bitcoin space with us as well. So Elizabeth and Alex, if you want to join that Bitcoin uh, space, just um, um, uh, just message me and the team will, will more than gladly bring you on um, onto those panels. Um, but yeah, I think Scott's channel will be good for anyone wanting to learn more because uh, it's like just general news updates, but also explaining different things in the ecosystem um, that I think will be very useful for everyone listening to, to learn. We, we, we make the content, we, we, we build the content that's, uh, for ourselves and hope that it's beneficial to everyone else. So like, what do I want to learn about? And who do I want to learn about it from? Uh, we do that, we, we go pitch them and then, uh, you know, watch the videos is, so we can speak intelligently. This is this is actually genuinely true. Like I listen to, I listen to your channel, Scott, whenever I want to get the updates for the day or Rand's channel. Uh, it's a bit too gummy-ish for me now, but Ryan and your channel are probably the two main channels I listen to right now. And then uh, I, in terms of uh, news, I look at my Twitter account for news. So my team posts the news on my account, so I want to see what's happening today. I look at my account, but also this, the space is a bit more, a bit longer form. Uh, but yeah, sorry, we've just kind of blabbered about this too much. But um, yeah, again, anyway, yeah, in the audience, TV, TV listen, learn, yeah. learn about Bitcoin. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I think when I was doing a panel, Scott, you were there. Remember when Brock said something? On the on the yacht in uh, in, uh, in 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 2049, he said. Um, yeah, we we're doing that together. Yeah, yeah, I know. But remember when he said Bitcoin is king, and when you're king, you don't need to hurry. You just wait for everyone else to do all the innovation, and then you can come in late because you're king. You don't give a fuck. Um, so this is uh, probably a good explanation of where Bitcoin is at right now. Yeah, basically, that was basically the uh, everything else has been a test net for building on Bitcoin argument, right? Whether, which was unintentional, obviously, when Taproot sort of uh, changed things. But, you know, and now you can see, hey, what completely failed and what, what was a complete scam or what was a complete uh, disaster elsewhere and try to filter it out. But sadly, uh, as Alex's point, if people don't learn those lessons. They just roll with what's hot. And so half those same people just see the Bitcoin narrative and go try to pretend to build something uh, there. So you know, once again, separating wheat from chaff there, I think really difficult. But DB, man, I got to go to you. We've been like, we've interrupted like 15 times. So uh, DB, then, then Richard, go ahead. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, no worries. I love this chat. I'm actually looking forward to the chat you guys have with them. So you got brilliant people up here. I actually have a question for Liz and uh, Alex in just a second, but back to the markets real quick. I have the same sentiment as pretty much the entire panel. Fred's dead on. I think this November could make or break things too. It's going to be crucial. And Juan is pointing out that innovation, it's, it's all over the place. We've got interoperability and chain abstraction, which is going to really lead to bringing in the masses. And aside from that, I wanted to point out something that I pinned up top that I just found this morning from the head of crypto from Visa showing still how early we are and how there's still not much usage in capital, capital in space. He, he was able to break it down using metrics to see that 10% of the stablecoin volume is actual users and not just bots trading back and forth. So I'd say that's still a sign of how early we are, I'd say, and how how big this year and next year is going to get because the big money and the retail hasn't even stepped in yet. Richard. Yeah, thanks. Uh, right. I see my, my fellow countryman, Vinny's online. Um, so, yeah, Vin's been a contrarian for the last couple of weeks calling a local top. So I suppose not to, to fuel his contrarian views right now. My question is, Vin, what's what's your actual bull case, if any? Because um, I'm, I'm curious to hear, being someone who's uh, been in crypto and remains in crypto for quite some time, uh, you know, what's your outlook for the rest of the year? I mean, I think most of the people here are relatively bullish, but uh, you took some flack over the last couple of weeks with uh, some of your price predictions and macro concerns. So yeah, what's your bull case? We know what your contrarian case is. Vinny, you there? We, we see you, you gave him the uh, softball of the century there, Richard. You threw it up, you, you, you teed him off, and nothing. Nothing. Ghosted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Anyone else want to take the uh, same, uh, same same question for Richard? <laughs> I, I mean, I also, well, honestly, Vinny and I have talked uh, quite a bit kind of behind the scenes. I, I also thought, you know, around 74K was going to be a local top for quite a while and have been saying it for, for a while. And, you know, the, the same kind of comments, I think, from the uh, euphoric straight to 100K crowd, who I don't blame, um, that I was getting when I said, hey, hey, 
calm down. When meme coins go this nuts, when there's this much froth, when people are sending $30 million in 30 minutes to an anonymous person's random Solana contract right before the tweet gets deleted, it's usually a pretty decent sign of froth. And if you look at the halving cycle, things should calm down for a few months before up. But the same kind of uh, anger I got at even implying that uh, we were still going to go up, but not yet, which was my case. Like, yeah, we're still going way up. It's just going to take a while. We're getting the same kind of anger now, in my opinion, saying that uh, if you say, not here, because everybody seems to be very bullish, but just in the comments, I think with retail that like, it's possible that we're just ranging and it's not all over. So yeah, uh, DB, go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I forgot to ask my question to Liz and Alex. And about the, the whole runes, ordinals, inscriptions narrative. And I'm curious to see where you think it's really going to end up going. Because right now, I kind of look at it like Bitcoin Maxi is trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And we've got Bitcoin, which is a, a great store of value and has a certain purpose. And we've got all these amazing smart contract platforms. What's, where's this going? What's the intention of all these uh, inscriptions, ordinals, runes, everything. Yeah, I can touch on this. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. Like we've, we've had NFTs on Bitcoin before, like you've always been able to put data on the Bitcoin chain, but it's been in a very limited way. And so ultimately we didn't see much adoption on Bitcoin because a lot of this interesting activity and a lot of this fun stuff was taking off in other chains like Ethereum. So I think ordinals are really showing that in regards to narrative, like people want to do more than just hold their Bitcoin. And now they can do more. It's it's really shifting this narrative for Bitcoin and bringing a whole new wave of builders to the ecosystem. And I would say also lending integrity to those who are already there building. Um, because I think people who are here building have this conviction to build on what is the strongest and most secure settlement layer. So it's really a huge renaissance moment for Bitcoin. And um, it's it's so perfect because art is is the most powerful medium to enact change. And so if we want to see change in this ecosystem, um, you know, I think Ordinals is, is probably the most pro pro appropriate way, which is a bit ironic. I mean, some of these, <laughs> some of these DGEN collections are, are pretty, pretty out there, but um, they're fun and it's rallying people together. It's rallying communities together. And I think there's a lot to be said around this attention economy and, and what holds people's attention. And, and uh, that, I think that's what the art is there for. And that's what the entertainment it's, it's, um, it's fun. And it's easy for people to wrap their heads around. And I, I think that's what's driving a lot of the value there. And then on a more serious tone, that's that's also what's what's creating this, uh, you know, the pain points around the transactions and understanding, okay, you know, Bitcoin's a more clunky ecosystem to navigate. So how do we make this super easy for people and um, a more smooth experience? And that's where the whole L2 narrative comes in. Uh, speaking of that, just really quickly, because I just saw it, uh, speaking of NFTs, just in CryptoPunk number 635 has been sold for 4,000 ETH, aka 12 million, 405,000 dollars. That's money laundering. That's money laundering. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no fucking way. There's no way. There's no way. Uh, anyways, uh, I, I just saw it and had my own uh, knee-jerk reaction in real time. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, come on. Fred, you can uh, feel free. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say one thing on the market side. I know I had my bear take earlier, but you know, we talk about the cycle and you've talked about the month time period. And, you know, I think the, the bull cycle doesn't get off to the euphoric part for another five to eight months. Things always just line up and sort of happen when they're supposed to happen. And, you know, on the law front, we've got two big things that will start happening in August, you know, September ish, which is we'll get a ruling that should conclude the district court case and the ripple of the SEC matter. And that's important because. One of the things they're trying to figure out is what is Ripple going to be uh, precluded from doing? I know uh, the channel posted uh, something about the response that the company filed uh, yesterday, so I don't I don't think you guys covered it. But they're going, you know, what's at play is is Ripple going to get an injunction from doing certain core business practices and. Their liquidity tool is what's uh, being evaluated by the judge, and it's unique to Ripple in one sense, but it also can be generalized enough where other large corporations can say, oh, how we use 
um, these assets in our treasury or in our business operations, you know, this is what the ruling was from the SEC here. So if that's favorable, that's a catalyst. And then Coinbase is fighting the SEC and they're trying to bypass right now everything happening at the district court level to go right to uh, the Second Circuit. And if that's allowed to go to the Second Circuit, that'll kind of fast forward everything by a couple of years and could change the narrative as well. So we've got these things that are lining up that, you know, I'm still a bull, but, um, you know, keep in mind everything's going on. But we, we've got a lot of events that could be happening end of summer, fall. Richard. Okay, I'm going to throw out a question. Um, you know, we've got so many varying external factors which you know we're weighing up on a daily basis these things come at us uh, hard and fast but if uh, you know putting the question out to each speaker if you had to name one uh, concern that you had for uh, your your positioning in in this industry what would it be i mean i'll say going off of what fred was saying i'm far more concerned and focused on the court cases um than i am on the elections like Who's president fine affects who's like running the SEC, which is some of the short term stuff. But given that it just seems impossible to get Congress to actually write a damn law and 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 put a new proper market structure about things, and like there's obviously a new stable coin bill that came out a couple weeks ago, but needs a lot of revision despite it coming from people who believe in the future of crypto. Anyways, it's just the the thing that really matters. Um, we've got to take our eyes off like these three or six month cycles. They don't matter. What matters is the 10 year cycles, right? What are we actually getting built? What is the infrastructure that is, I mean, this is true in the normal world too. What's the infrastructure that's getting built that's gonna lead to the next generation of companies? And so to that end, what the actual policies and laws are will affect far more what companies are able to exist and able to build, which means if Congress isn't gonna pass the laws and you know a few different senators or house reps getting elected isn't gonna change that, isn't gonna change the fundamental dysfunction that we have, then it really comes down to the court cases. Unless we get rid of Elizabeth Warren. Cause Dude, Elizabeth Warren's is. never passed a bill in her entire freaking career. Like she introduced it's not about stuff. it's not about it's not about her litigation. If you ask anybody on Capitol Hill or have a conversation, it's, it's very publicly known. She's you know, her her deal was that she got to effectively create uh, control you know uh finance in the banking industry and crypto policy she's the one who pushed for gary gensler she's the one who implanted people in the white house that have given us the policy from the biden white house and if she's gone there's a better chance than not that that will be gone as well and things will soften so we got oh, yeah. here like said, John I'm, not, I'm, not the there's no, I'm not saying there's no difference to it certainly again not having like gary gensler in charge of the sec would obviously be better for crypto but like a lot of the moves that are made using executive power are so blunted by court, you know, short court actions and, and um, uh, you know, restraining orders and things like it's less of a big deal than the cases that actually get settled out and the law that it actually gets. And I mean, and that, that's pro provable by what we've seen with the SEC over the last year, right? Because if you looked even a year ago this time, the sentiment was that factually that the SEC never loses, right? They don't bring a court case that they lose. They win 99% of the time. Gary Gensler can do whatever he wants, and he's just gotten his ass kicked by the courts for a year straight. So, you know, uh, their, their power becomes less and less each time the courts push back. And anyone who wasn't paying attention to debt box recently or saw that in the past few days, two SEC crypto lawyers resigned as a result. But if you didn't see the insanity of the debt box scandal we can call it fraud perjury whatever you want where the sec literally made up uh made up information and data and pushed and froze debt boxes assets and the individual's assets without debt box even having the opportunity to defend themselves and then a judge takes 81 pages i believe it was to talk about the criminality of the SEC and now we actually see two of them resigning. I mean, it shows everything we need to know about that agency. I would love to have met a lawman here again, James Murphy, to go over it. But I mean, he made the point that Congress shouldn't even be funding uh, the SEC's crypto efforts anymore based on based on. 
Yeah, I was just going to add on that, Scott. The uh, the lawyers in that case were like, you owe us $1.8 million SEC for all the legal fees. And so they're going to take a huge chunk out of the SEC for that, and it's going to be glorious. And by the way, who pays that? Well, Taxpayers. I mean, you, know, you. You pay that. Uh, yeah, it's really fun to watch the SEC have to pay money that's ours. Great. Terrific. Awesome. Wonderful. Dave. Yeah, I mean, look, it, 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 we're not going to get anywhere um, until there's uh, until after the election, for sure, and then we'll see if any of these issues shake out. The truth is that the, the Republicans, you know, talking about trying to depoliticize the SEC, you know, maybe that can gain traction, but probably not. The reality that this SEC has has done is they've kind of defied decades of precedent. Uh, to not care and ring up lots of legal fees and do regulation by enforcement without you know any any implication of harm, it, it is coming home to roost. But it's going to take a while before any of that changes. So the reality is, you know, the courts are the only thing that's keeping you know the market, you know, them from pushing the market outside the U.S. And it's it's very clear what they're trying to do. But it's equally clear that they're not winning. And, you know, we're just going to live in this world for a while. It's I wish to God it wasn't true. But it's why every crypto entrepreneur, every crypto firm uh, ha is moving more and more stuff overseas. It's because we have no choice. But the good news, Dave, the, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. But the good news no, is that cool. we would have made we would, we would have made those same comments a year ago in a much worse situation than where we are now just because the courts have pushed back and the industry has won here and there. So some of the precedents that the courts are setting, at least if we're not getting policy, give us some wiggle room, right? Now, the, the one point I want to make, and I can't give up individuals because it's not fair to them, but you know, I was in DC a couple of weeks ago. I think I told you this, Scott, and I talked with multiple people who are at the senior, but at the staff level at the SEC, and they're miserable. I mean, the, the number of miserable people in that building because they're being forced to do things in a way that is not uh, the way they would want to do them is significant. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying that if a regime change happened and it went to, forget the politics, if it went to a, a centrist, somebody who wasn't, uh, who was more back online with policy, which is, you know, hey, we're supposed to protect investors. Hey, we're supposed to work with the industry. And there's all sorts of good reasons why that that's important. Uh, and, you know, the whole, the whole self-regulatory structure is built upon the idea of regulating using industry expertise, yet we've had now had two SEC, in, in, you know, set basically between Clayton, which is inexcusable in my mind, and, and Gensler. We've had the SEC literally not be willing to engage with the industry unless your name was Sam Bankman-Fried. And, and you can't possibly say it any other way, but that is the absolute truth. So the only person in the industry they engaged with was a sociopathic uh, criminal uh, on almost a bond villain scale. That, that's literally the only person they engaged with. So, I mean, that's the world we live in. But what the, the bullish part is, if you did get a regime change, the staff actually does want to work with the industry and does want to do the right thing. So it's not like the organization can't be saved. It's, it really just needs to change. Mm, sounds like America in general. Uh, so yeah, uh, we did want to circle. I don't know, Vinny, are you, are you back? Yeah. So Vinny, uh, Vinny is, uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I, did, I did want to circle back because, uh, Richard had asked you a question you may have missed earlier. Richard, yeah, you want to ask him again? I had a phone call come through. Sorry. Yep. Hey, Vin. Um, yeah, well, I, I was just pointing out, uh, you know, obviously you've been tracking your comments on spaces or online. Just uh, contrarian views, calling local top. But I mean, we know what you're, you've, you've had pretty strong views, both macro and crypto related. What's your actual bull case for the next 12 to 18 months? Um, I mean, the, the, the bull case really is um, that the US government basically prints a shitload of money, uh, more than they have in the previous years, because something breaks in the markets, whether it's the treasury market or something else. Because look, fundamentally, um, Bitcoin and then the rest of crypto is all a function of, of global liquidity. If, there's, if liquidity is in the system or comes back into the system, uh, it's going to pump. And if when liquidity gets drained, it goes down. Uh, Bitcoin gets affected the, you know, the, 
So the alts, the alts, <laughs> the way I look at it is alts are basically a function of Bitcoin's uh, liquidity and Bitcoin is a function of global um, dollar liquidity for the most part anyway. Um, and so you always, and this is why you, the alts always run after Bitcoin's uh, stepped up and, until Bitcoin gets is like to like 60, 70, 80% if and until it gets to that sort of level of dominance, it's always going to be kind of a downstream effect. You know, it's like a champagne tower. So the money always goes into Bitcoin first and then it flows down. So if you're looking for uh, the bull case, it's just basically some some global market dysfunction that forces them to just keep printing more money and then you see, uh, you know, Bitcoin going up and gold going up. But but here's the, the downside is, that, you know, there's probably still a little bit more ammunition and more options that they've got um, before they actually get to that point where they have to go sort of unlimited printing. And that's what everyone mistakes. Everyone thinks it's going to collapse next week, next month, this year. Uh, yeah, the, the U.S. has got a lot. They, they've got a lot of ammunition. Um, I don't mean the war type, um, financial ammunition, right? So there's a lot of things that the Fed can do when it comes to um, providing liquidity to banks, um, stabilized markets, local markets, global markets. The most concerning thing right now for anyone watching should be that um, you know the, the the yen. And I was in Japan, uh, geez, a few weeks ago. I was at like 144, 143. It's 155 today, last I checked. Um, th that's a serious depreciation of, of, of a major international currency in a, in, in a short space of time, okay? So what does it mean? It means that the Japanese, and they've already come out today saying this, or yesterday, saying that they have to defend their currency because they, they're an island, they import a lot, they can't afford to have a weak currency for, for lots of reasons. And... Um, they're going to have to sell U.S. Treasuries. And the last I checked, is they were having about a trillion dollars in, in U.S. Treasuries, most of them long-dated, um, you know, 10 years, maybe some 20s and stuff. Um, but they're going to have to sell that. So that's why you've seen today, you've seen the markets, you've seen the, 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 yields, the yields are just, you know, up sharply. Um, they have to go and raise dollars to go and buy back the currency or at least, you know, defend the currency and, and prevent it from going down. Um, anyway, th this stuff doesn't play out as... as it plays out much faster in our minds than it does in real life. So even though you can look forward and say this whole thing is going to collapse, endless printing, hyper-Bitcoinization, yes, 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 whatever, whatever viewpoint you have, it takes a long time to play out. Uh, and yes, you can use the whole slowly then instantly sort of moniker. And it, it, yeah, it maybe works eventually. But f for the most part, I think we're going to be sitting and watching uh, how, how it's a, it's a kind of watching a train wreck in slow motion. And, um, you know, but it's, it's not, it's not quite wrecked yet. So it's like, it's like kind of a Schrodinger's train. Is it, is it a wreck or is it a train wreck in motion? <laughs> Simon. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, just, just listening to everyone's comments, we, we just really seem to have hit like, yeah, okay. Well, when, when, when is, when is the point of something bad happening? But the only things that we seem to be talking about is just corruption, lobbying, money printing, government, excessive size, excessive control, excessive debt. Like, we, we have just hit a real dark point where we're reliant upon, we, we think we have capitalist free markets. And all we have is a request to print more money um, so that everyone can keep their bags going. And then we have governments that just literally, the regulators and governments are just a function of who's lobbying hardest. Is it the banking lobby? Is it the Sam Bankman Freed lobby? Is it the Israeli lobby? Who is it? So, um, so, so, but the, the one thing I will say is that I think there's too much focus on this global coordinated, you know, Illuminati, you know, sort of uh, environment that we're in where everyone thinks there's some big coordination by the global bankers. I think they're also fucking stupid. They couldn't coordinate the way out of a paper bag, to be quite honest. And I think they're basically all in it for themselves. They're all trying to figure out what each of the countries are going to do. And they're all suddenly now going, shit, we screwed up. How do we fix this? And then they keep looking at the U.S. and what the U.S. is doing. And the U.S. is just saying, look, we're going to do what's in the U.S. best interest. And that may even be, and I've said this like two months ago, raising rates again, because guess what? I don't think Powell is going to like what he sees tomorrow when PCE numbers come out, and I think they may have to opt for it. And here's the other thing, because they're well aware that the U.S. is in a state of fiscal dominance right now, which really means that even a slight raise 
in the interest rate, it's going to be stimulatory to the economy, especially since we saw the GDP numbers today. So I think there'll be even more, uh, uh, more impetus to raise rates now and not cut um, and let the rest of the world feel a bit more pain. And that's what's going to get everyone's back up. So I, I just don't believe in a coordinated... I, I don't think the, the world's governments can coordinate on anything, quite frankly. Yeah, no, I, def I definitely don't think it's coordination, but every single fiat currency is a Ponzi scheme and it's been co-opted by central banks. That That is a fact. Uh, yeah, there's, more debt, there's more debt than money, so the only the only outcome of a Ponzi scheme where there's more debt than money is is more debt. If you, Madoff, if you want to... Madoff, Madoff didn't have an army, man. Madoff did not have guys and guns and, and, and jails and police stations and whatever else. And that's the rest, that's how the world works. So governments can run Ponzi schemes because they're not the ones that get arrested and get put in jail. They're not the ones that have to be, you know... They, they can, but they can't run them forever. Like, maths doesn't change. Even if you've got guns. If you put a guns to maths, it still doesn't yeah. change the maths. I, I'll challenge you on that. So what happened in Zimbabwe? They, they, they ran it up. They ponzi the currency to nothing. And then basically said, well, fuck it. That this currency doesn't work anymore. We'll just go use a proxy currency, and we're going to still function as a as a nation state. And we, even though even though that currency doesn't work, we'll force you to use this one, or we'll use rands, or we'll use dollars, and they'll just proxy in. But they, you know, it, it didn't change the you know the economy. They didn't go and use uh, they didn't use Bitcoin, for example. They they went to use a, a trading partner's currency. But there is, there is a major side effect, and that's wealth inequality. And wealth inequality creates civil unrest. And civil unrest creates change. Uh, Zimbabwe means. I mean, Richard, Richard, and I are both South African, and you know, we, you know, I can tell you, I was living in Johannesburg at the time when Zimbabwe was collapsing and all the civil unrest. And guess what? Mugabe was still in power for another ten or fifteen years until he died. It does. That, civil unrest doesn't guarantee change. No, because you've got a dollar, so you can function on a dollar. But what about what happens when the world reserve currency is the one that's changing? You know, that's, we've, we've been here before. I, no. That's going to be the. That's my point. The U.S. is only sitting on a, a debt to GDP ratio of like one hundred and thirty percent. Japan sitting at over two hundred. The entire world sitting at three hundred and seventy five percent right now. When you look at the dominoes fall, the U.S. is going to be the last to fall because the U.S. will, will export its problems to the rest of the world first before taking it on the chin. And then it's and, Mad and Max. And that's when you have. An and then it's war. Mad Max. <laughs> well, that's when you have a war, right? When you extern, when you externalize inflation across the world. You get the world addicted to IMF death, and then that creates the situation that we're in right now where everyone's an enemy because they're <laughs> using their central banks to pay off their dollar reserves and destroying the welfare of their population. But how long do you think that takes? I mean, even with the, even with the SDRs and everything else and how in intricately linked every other currency is, you have to wait for a lot of currencies to go bang at the same time for this to happen. I'm Isn't not that saying, happening now? No, this is my point. It's the, the, like our time scales as humans watching this un, uh, unfold over time is just distorted. You think it's going to happen this year, this month? It'll only happen when there's some global financial crisis with massive dysfunction on a global scale. It, you know, it, they, they, whenever there's a thing, it was like whack a mole. Like even, even the US banking situation last year in March, they plugged it. No, no problem. Let's move on. We just close on four or five banks and we'll forget about it. And the world just carries on. And so it'll keep happening until it gets to the point where it's untenable. The U.S. has still got probably uh, $15 trillion more, in my, in my opinion, in, in reserves, phantom reserves, before it becomes a problem. It's, it's going to cause inflation. It's going to have issues. But that's before we see the end of the world sort of situation with the dollar. But in the interim, you're going to see other smaller countries who are just really indebted go down first. And that's going to happen very soon, this year. But it's not going to be the U the U.S. Dave, really quick, and then we got to we got to wrap. Oh, Vinny, you can finish up. Then Dave, but yeah, we got to move to wrap. Go ahead. Dave can go. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that that the, the Vinny, I, I agree with both what you and Simon are saying. I know that that that, that sounds crazy. I think Simon uh, is right in in a sense in the fourth turning sense that will go somewhere. I think that it's a long way off. I think that we have expert can kickers 
running most of the the governments of the world that matter. Uh, so uh, you know, and so Vinny, your point on time scale is absolutely right. The the thing that's interesting about you know tactically is the narrative shift to people saying that the best way to decrease inflation is by cutting rates because that will decrease owners equivalent rent. That that narrative is gaining a lot of traction. And as a result, I strongly suspect that I don't know whether they'll be able to, to cut rates at all this year, maybe a little bit, uh, but I really doubt they're going to raise rates. I think going into an election year, I would be beyond stunned if they did that. And the flattening of the yield curve is is kind of important but look as long as they can keep the long end below five percent they're not going to panic the long end at 4.7 which is what you refer to today the 10-year uh is troubling but if it gets towards five again which it did you know briefly six months ago that's when you think the big cannons come out and that's when you'll get another round of qe they may not call it that but it'll happen and and people should be looking for that and i think that people like arthur hayes and others are sniffing around saying this is inevitable because Basically, it is inevitable, and that's where the rally will come from in in Bitcoin, at least, you know, toward the back end of the year. But our t right now, we're in a range, and you know, we keep talking about it. But I, I agree with you, Vinny. I think the timescales of people who expect some some action to happen at like some fulcrum point, like now, uh, I just don't think that's true. What a conversation! I absolutely love this show that we get to show up every day and can have such a wide breadth of topics from such incredible speakers. Man, I, I don't say it often, but um, you know, uh, it's really an honor to be able to show up here and ask questions and shut up and learn from people a hell of a lot smarter than me. I, I really, really enjoyed today's conversation. Of course, we'll be back uh, tomorrow morning at ten fifteen a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm still laughing internally that Alex uh, implied that I was billionaire dark political money. Uh, from Florida trying to uh, engage in a Massachusetts election, if only. Man, now, now at least, Alex, you've given me something to aspire to. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, guys, one yeah, we'll be back. One day. Yeah, one day, man. One day. You, you and me together, buddy. Uh, 10, 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow will be the last show of the week. Don't forget to tune in. Bye, everyone. Have a good one. Cheers.